So, it was F-16 after all. At the G7 meeting in Hiroshima on the 19th of May 2023, the US President Biden said that he wasn't opposed to NATO countries training Ukrainian pilots on F-16 fighters. This consideration closed many months of incertitude when several countries discussed the possibility of providing combat aircraft to Ukraine. This announcement has been interpreted worldwide as the green light that was necessary to implement this decision. We discussed this option before on this channel, but now that it is practically official, it is worth coming back to it. Yes, because we are going to see an interesting experiment. We are going to see the creation of a Western-style air force on the ashes of a Soviet-style air force in the middle of a survival struggle. There are other cases of transitions, of course, most of the Eastern Europe air forces went through something similar, but never during a war. And you will forgive me if the editing and the production value won't be at the same level as other videos. We will start analyzing the Ukrainian requirement. They have been chasing Western combat jets since almost the beginning of the war, so let's understand why. Then we will move on to discussing the aircraft that have been considered suitable for Ukraine. Then, since the F-16 is now the front-runner, we will focus on the possible provenance of these aircraft. Then we will discuss the weapons and the capabilities that these may bring to the table, because the aircraft itself doesn't mean much without the weapons. And after that, we will do what few do. That is, we will detach from the platform and see what kind of challenges are going to present themselves in the process of building this capability. And finally, we will see what this capability might do on the battlefield and how it can affect the war. And we will drop here and there some pieces of information that are not widely known unless you are a massive aircraft junkie like I am. So grab a cup of your favorite drink, get comfortable, and let's start. I don't have a favorite drink, sir. I don't drink at all. Uh, Otis, that was for the viewers. Please get prepared as usual, okay? The Ukrainian Air Force managed to limit the losses at the beginning of the war, surprising several analysts, including myself. However, their capabilities were severely hampered by the necessity of operating in austere conditions, out of improvised bases near suitable road segments. The Soviet legacy helped them, being the Russian aircraft particularly rugged and adaptable to these conditions. I don't know if these operations have been trained before the war, but Ukrainians quickly adapted. They managed to maintain a rate around 5 to 10 daily missions for fixed-wing aircraft. They have received several injections of spares in early 22 and whole aircraft in 2023. They have received 13 MiG-29 from Slovakia and 11 to 19 MiG-29 from Poland, plus several other airframes of various types from various countries in good or non-flyable conditions to be used as spares. Nonetheless, a slow drip of losses eroded the Ukrainian Air Force. Every time they operated close to the line of contact, they suffered from the long-range air-to-air weapons deployed by the Russian combat air patrols and the network of long-range Russian air defenses. By early 2023, when the storm of Russian missile attacks subsided, they also managed to go back operating from their airfields, though not on a regular basis. Despite the good tactics and the initiative demonstrated from a technology point of view, the Ukrainian Air Force was and it is no match for the Russian Air Force. The Ukrainians have known since the beginning that they could neither establish air superiority nor seriously contribute to striking targets on the ground. They did it anyway, with great bravery, but the effect was limited. All the four types of combat aircraft operated by the Ukrainians are Soviet times legacies. There has been a lot of laughing about the civilian GPS receiver used by Russian Su-34 crews, but they are the norm in the Ukrainian Air Force too. So they needed to do something. And that something came in the form of the integration of Western weapons on the existing platforms. The first example in the summer of 2022 was the Harm missile. It was very ingeniously integrated with the MiG-29 and the Su-27. 
In 2023, JDAM guided bombs appeared. Their integration seemed less successful, mostly because of the Russian capability of spoofing the GPS signal used for guidance. As I record this in June 2023, the latest addition is the Storm Shadow cruise missile, integrated on the Suhoi 24, which is showing its usefulness attacking high pain targets in the Russian rear. These integrations demonstrated a lot of ingenuity and initiative, but despite the Western media hype, where every new tactical paperclip is a game changer and a turning point, they did not change the general course of the war. They have been useful, they had an effect, but the Russians adapted and their effectiveness decreased. Something else was needed, and to be honest, it was obvious since the beginning. If your air force is technologically inferior, if it is numerically inferior, if it has issues keeping the aircraft in the air because of the rough operating conditions and the lack of availability of spares, if there is no hope of closing these gaps because there is little availability of the aircraft you are flying anywhere else and these aircraft can't be procured, and if those that can be procured are quite old and not technologically equal to the VKS, if, if there are no weapons that can close the qualitative and quantitative gap that can be used by your platform, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're basically left with just one alternative. Build an air force from scratch with Western systems in the middle of a war. For as much as it can be overly difficult to do, the alternative is just irrelevance. So, provided that you could magic this new air force in existence, what would you do with it? Well, first thing, you need to be able to operate. In the case of Ukraine, this means contrasting the Russian air-to-air -air capabilities and their ground-based air defenses. In a situation like this, with clear-cut contact lines on the ground, the rules of engagement are simplified. This means that very long-range air-to-air engagements are possible with little risk of friendly fire and no sophisticated target recognition is required. In this case, a combination weapon aircraft at least on par of what the Russians can deploy is required. In the same way, the new Air Force should be capable of SIAD and DIAD missions against the Russian integrated air defenses. This in itself is a very complex and highly specialized discipline. Both these capabilities will be necessary to establish local air superiority and reduce the capability of at least portion of the airspace for at least the time required to operate and execute the mission. Well, and what could be the mission? In a context like the Ukrainian, uh, it will be mostly battlefield interdiction, with closer support as the second option. If executed with the necessary freedom, these kind of missions can incapacitate ground units at several levels, either inflicting high losses to the combat force or depriving it from the fire and logistic support very efficiently. Considering the depth of the Ukrainian territory occupied by the Russians, all the missions in the area can be considered as having a direct effect on the battlefield. In principle, Ukraine is publicly forbidden, mostly by fear of escalation, to strike deep in the Russian territory. Uh, which means that they do it, but they don't tell anyone. Which is also means that it is not doable with weapons that have a high profile like combat aircraft. But we will get back to this because it is a very important point. What is important now is that battlefield interdiction missions are conducted against a mix of fixed and mobile targets, and these two classes may require different weapons. For fixed targets, medium precision systems like the JDAM may be the bulk of the ordnance, with laser-guided systems for high precision strikes. For mobile targets, a weapon of the class of the Maverick or the British Brimstone may be required. I purposely left out long-range cruise missiles because if it is possible to get close enough to safely hit a target with a cheap JDAM, you should not use an expensive cruise missile. Furthermore, as we have seen several times in the Ukrainian war, it is legitimate to expect that the ordnance consumption is going to be very high, much higher than any pre-war analyst had expected. So whatever you need, you need a lot. The 
Ukrainians asked for Western combat aircraft almost from the start. Almost everyone who had some decently modern combat aircraft in reserve has been mentioned as a possible aircraft donor to Ukraine. An early proposal was presented by Eric Prince, founder of the PMC Blackwater, now named Academy. In December 2021, he advanced to the US government an interesting proposal. So the United States Air Force and the US Navy decommission several aircraft every year, but the airframes generally still have hundreds of flight hours left. Tapping into these machines and those in long-term storage at Davis Mountain, it would have been possible to transfer about 150 F-15s, F-16 and A-10s to Ukraine, at least according to Prince. Furthermore, a few A2Cs and KC-135 would have been available as force multipliers. The pilots and the ground personnel would have been drawn from the ranks of just retired US personnel who would have volunteered to serve in the Ukrainian Air Force. In this way, no active US military personnel or US active asset would have been involved in the conflict. No use to say nobody seriously considered the option at the time because it would have skipped the war in Ukraine to get directly to World War III. Note that this idea is not that yet, and occasionally some members of the US Armed Forces throw similar ideas into the debate. Luckily, nobody listens, at least for now. Another rather unfeasible idea surfaced at the beginning of 2023 when the UK weighted the option of giving Eurofighters to Ukraine. Uh, the idea is unfeasible at several levels. First is that there are no UK typhoons readily available and the British training assets are already under strain to maintain a modicum of operational crews. Looking outside UK, Austria is looking for a typhoon replacement, but they are just a dozen of worn airframes, quite old. The Typhoon is also a very expensive aircraft, maintenance-wise, and it requires a specialized logistic chain that makes a quick adoption not feasible. Moreover, would you really expose one of your best assets to a potential Russian capture? On the French side, the Rafale was briefly considered but discarded for the same reasons as the Eurofighter. However, the French have just retired the Mirage 2000C. The remaining Mirage 2005 and 2000D will be progressively replaced by the Rafale. And there are various other Mirage 2000s around the world that are nearing replacement. In May 2023, the French President Emmanuel Macron quite surprisingly said that the door to training Ukrainian pilots is open and it could start now. Which begs the question, training with what? Since France has a very autonomous defense procurement policy, I would be surprised if it could do anything not involving French equipment. Giving French aircraft to Ukraine would be a feasible option from the combat point of view. Any Mirage 2000 would be an improvement on the MiG-29s and Su-24s currently flown by Ukraine, and the Mirage 2005 would definitely be a bad customer for any Russian combat aircraft. The problem is, these aircraft carry mostly French weapons. True, the laser-guided GBU series has become integrated, but only the 2000D has a laser designator. And, and the air-to-air -air weaponry is entirely French. It would be debatable if France could sustain even a fraction of the ordnance consumption that is going to happen if two or three squadrons of Mirage 2000s are deployed in Ukraine. Furthermore, the Mirage 2000 is not a maintenance easy aircraft, it is quite complex and it requires some infrastructure to be kept flying. So, while not impossible for the moment, it's still unlikely to see the Mirage 2000 in Ukraine anytime soon. However, this war is going to end at some point. If an independent Ukrainian state is still going to exist, there will come a time when the Ukrainians want to build a proper air force. If the risk of conflict with Russia won't be subsided, it is very unlikely that they will jump on the F-35 bandwagon or receive any of the latest generation of uh, American weapons. So maybe there will be an interesting slot for France to slide in. The Rafale commercial success is largely because it comes with no strings attached, filling all the niches that the US want or can't fill. Such a niche in Ukraine could be a pretty large one. And if you are concerned about the money, well, no worries, Ukraine will never run out of money because it is a large business for the combined West, but this is an entirely different video. 
And by the way, a French MP formally asked what kind of training France is doing for Ukrainian pilots. And the answer was survival and escape. Yeah, okay, if they say so, it must be true. At this point, you may ask, yes, but what about the F-16s? Well, no rush, because there are other considerations before we get there that you may not have heard. One option that gained some traction in 2022 was the Swedish option. Since the beginning, several analysts maintained that the best option for Ukraine was the Swedish Gripen. The Gripen was designed since the beginning for the type of war the Ukrainians ended up fighting. It is designed to be low on maintenance, it is designed to operate in austere conditions, it is designed to be very adaptable, and it is designed to fight the Russians. It is quite expensive to acquire, but it is very cheap to operate. It integrates the types of weapons that are required in Ukraine, and if it doesn't, it is one of the easiest aircraft to integrate weapons with. The problem is, there are no airframes available for a quick delivery. Sweden has started replacing the CD variant with the EF, but the program is just beginning. Other countries have a limited number of Gripens, and they're using them. The Swedish Minister of Defense has recently been open for a long-term cooperation and transferred the Swedish aircraft as soon as they become available, but is not something that can be done now. So the Gripen is not an option, but there is a very real option that is not the F-16. 41 Australian F-18s A's and B's, the commissioned in 2021, are sitting in an hangar in Australia. They were originally sold to a private company that is flying an aggressor fleet, but when they lost an important contract, they sort of became available again. The Australian F-18As are all the aircraft nearing the end of their life, like all the options that have been considered so far, but their equipment has been modernized and there would be an important improvement to what is available now. The F-18, being a naval aircraft at its core, is built to operate in a hostile environment, so it would be a good fit for the Ukrainian requirement. Actually, the capability of using the arrestor hook for shore landings can be replicated on the ground, like the Finnish are doing with their fleet. There is indeed an official interest from Ukraine in this lot of aircraft. But while the interest on the F-16 has been going on for a long time, we have no trace of interest on the F-18 till recently. Why is this important? Well, we will get back to that later. However, the F-18 is an option that is gaining traction, and it is probably the second most likely option at the moment. Because, ça va sans dire, the most likely option is still the F-16. The F-16 has been, since the beginning, the aircraft the Ukrainians were asking for. Not because it is the best, but because it is readily available in large number either in the United States or in Europe. While there is a high request of second-hand F-16s in the world, many countries are also replacing them with the F-35. So progressively, more and more aircraft are becoming available. The fact that many of them are quite old airframes is less important than it may seem. Ukraine is in a war and they are expected to be treated quite quickly. A few hundred hours may be all is needed since they will be damaged or lost in action before they expire. Sure, not all of them, not saying that, but many will. In World War II, combat aircraft were often designed with a useful life in the hundreds of hours because they would either crash or be shot down before getting old. But I'm digressing. The American stock is potentially huge, but not easy to access. The aircraft in storage at Devs Monthan are not that many because they have been converted in target drones. What remains could be a source, but they are very old aircraft that would require a lot of work to be brought back to flight condition, and they would also require several upgrades to be effective in the modern battlefield. The aircraft being dismissed by the United States Air Force are becoming aggressor for the US Navy and the private sector is also interested in them. While the F-35 program progresses, several units will become available, but the US seems to be disinclined to directly provide airframes and surely not in a short time. So, where are these F-16 that could help Ukraine? There are several NATO countries that fly the F-16, and some of those are being replaced by the F-35. 
So maybe there are airframes in Europe that could be transferred to Ukraine. Well, this is not the case of Portugal. The country has recently reduced its fleet to 25 aircraft by selling a surplus, but there is no decision about how to replace these aircraft. These are reasonably modern planes, but Portugal needs them for now and probably for many years to come. And they're not in Greece either. Greece operates a large fleet of about 150 aircraft. 84 aircraft are being upgraded to the Block 7072 standard, the most modern standard available. The others are Block 30 aircraft, quite old, that went through a service life extension. These might be available one day, but the Greeks have a problem that makes them keep hold of their weapons till they have a better replacement. That is, Turkey. Turkey operates the largest F-16 fleet in NATO after the US, with 245 aircraft in service. They acquired Block 30, 50 and 50 plus aircraft, but they have all been brought to roughly the same upgraded standards along the years. Turkey has an update program ongoing and it is also trying to acquire newly built aircraft. It is unlikely that they are going to part with any aircraft now. Furthermore, considering the Turkish political position, which is not openly supportive of any of the two sides, uh, well, I believe there is no chance. And if the aircraft are not going to come from the Mediterranean, they are likely not coming from Eastern Europe too. Poland operates 46 F-16 Block 52 Plus, delivered between 2006 and 2008, so quite a modern configuration. Though the Polish government feels to be the tip of the spear against Russia, so they categorically excluded the possibility of a transfer to Ukraine. In their place, Poland has transferred to Ukraine its aging fleet of MiG-29s, but it is keeping the best aircraft, just in case. The other Eastern European operator is Romania. The country has acquired in the past 17 used aircraft from Portugal, and that's it. They recently retired their residual MiG-21 fleet, and this handful of F-16s are the only combat aircraft operated in the country. However, they acquired 32 used Norwegian aircraft, whose deliveries should be starting by the end of the year. Norway has now standardized its line on the F-35. They replaced a fleet of 76 F-16s, 56 of which updated with a MLU program. These F-16s had been, early in 2022, earmarked as a possible option for Ukraine, even because Romania too has plans to jump on the F-35 bandwagon, so maybe won't acquire all the 32 Norwegian machines. However, I can imagine the feeling of the Romanian pilots waiting for their aircraft, learning that they will need to wait years, fighting for flight towers on what is available because they are waiting for the delivery of the F-35s. So the Romanian aircraft may be an option in a few years if they will still have a residual life, but not now. This leaves us with the Nordic option, a group of countries that has always been very supportive of Ukraine. Belgium operates 54 aircraft between combat and trainers. The combat aircraft have been upgraded to a version called AM, equivalent to the F-16 CD Block 52. The aircraft is also integrated with several different types of guided weapons. They are basically among the most modern aircraft available in Europe. I mean, the most modern F-16s available in Europe. The Belgian government, though, while being open to train pilots and provide services, has excluded that any aircraft will be delivered. The F-35 is arriving here too, but is not happening immediately. Denmark flies 43 aircraft in a configuration similar to Belgium, and they may have some flyable airframes in reserve. The Danish government is open to a transfer, but it is waiting to see what other countries are doing. And to keep all the doors open, they are also in touch with some South American countries for a potential sale. The first Danish F-35s have been delivered this year, but they are in the United States for training and they will stay there for a while. Do you start seeing a pattern here? US that say that they are not against the Europeans providing the F-16 to Ukraine, while most of these countries that could provide the F-16s are already acquiring the F-35s. It is a good way to kill two birds with one stone, support Ukraine and accelerate and consolidate the European transition to the F-35, which is more a place of the soul than a combat aircraft, but this is a different story. And this brings us to the Netherlands. 
The Dutch have been very open to a transfer because they recently made good progress in deploying the F-35s. There are about 30 surplus Dutch F-16s in relatively good conditions, updated to the same relatively advanced standard as the Belgian and the Danish. These aircraft are the most likely candidates to end up in Ukraine in a short period of time, together eventually with the few remaining Norwegian F-16s. In both cases, there are still large stores of spares to support prolonged operations. So, this is the extent of what is available for Ukraine in the short term. 30 to 40 used aircraft, updated to a quite capable standard, but definitely not the most modern. There are many more airframes available in Europe, but they are in use while waiting for the F-35s or other replacements, and they won't be available for a few years. Sure, more airframes may arrive in the future, and don't forget the possibility of the F-18s and the Mirage 2000s, but the order of magnitude of the possible immediate effort is about 40 aircraft, three squadrons of 12 and a few reserves. Is this going to make any difference? The aircraft as such doesn't mean much without the weapons. Or better, without the capabilities provided by the system composed by the aircraft, the weapons, a capable pilot and the whole enormous infrastructure that is necessary to make the missions happen. But for now, let's focus on the capabilities that the ex-Dutch or ex-Norwegian F-16s would bring to the table through the lens of the missions we discussed at the beginning. So everything would begin from air to air. Air power cannot decisively operate if there's no air superiority. How would an F-16 do against the three potential air-to-air -air adversaries, the Su-35, the MiG-31 and the Suhoi-30? A next Dutch or Norwegian F-16 could be armed with an Amram C-7 or C-8 as their main air-to-air -air weapon. None of those would be armed with the latest Amram D. Both countries have received the authorization for the D variant, but only for the F-35s. And why the Amram variant is important? Because like with many modern systems, the Amram airframe was performing well enough since the beginning to remain current till now, while the electronics and the chemicals for the propulsion evolved much more quickly than aerodynamics and structures. The C-Series has a max range against a cooperative target with launch at ideal altitude and speed of about 70 nautical miles or about 130 kilometers. The D has a range of about 100 nautical miles or 180 kilometers in the same conditions, so it would be an improvement, but I don't think it would be available. And the actual numbers are obviously secret, but this is sort of the consensus of the available estimate. Why this is important? Because currently the Ukrainians have a severe kinematic disadvantage. They have short-range and old weapons, the R-27s, and they fly low to avoid the Russian integrated air defenses. The Russians can fly high at high speed and they have better performing weapons. The R-77 is the standard medium-range air-to-air missile in service with the VKS. The export model is known to be kinematically equivalent to the Amram C, so the variant in service with the VKS should be slightly better. The R-77M, an improved variant which has been rarely seen so far, should be kinematically on par with the Amram D. So, it is in theory possible that, from a kinematic point of view, the Dynamic Duo F-16 plus Amram could level the playing field. Unless. While the Russians seem to also have large numbers of the R-37 and R-37Ms, these are large, long-range air-to-air weapons capable of reaching targets at about 250 nautical miles or about 400 kilometers. It is capable of Mach 6, and its seeker has demonstrated to be very, very capable, hitting non-cooperative maneuvering targets almost at the far end of the envelope. It has been seen with the MiG-31s and the Suhoi 35s. Both aircraft have radars capable of providing a launch solution very long range against non-stealth targets flying at low altitude. Against this weapon, everyone else today is outclassed. Probably the coming AM-260 will match the performance or maybe the new Chinese giant missile that has been spotted some time ago is comparable, but for now, the R-37 is in a class of its own. 
The F-16 would likely be more survivable than the Russian aircraft currently in use in Ukraine because we expect that the Electronic Warfare System or the APG-66 radar would be capable of identifying the launch at long distance, thus giving the pilot more time to evade. And, by the way, the upgraded APG-66 is an excellent pulse Doppler radar, but it will end up against the PESA radars of the Su-35 and the MiG-31, which are of a different class. So, on paper, in beyond visual range combat, it would be a great improvement on the current Ukrainian lineup, and while the F-16 could end up in a pretty even situation, there will still be many cases where it would be outclassed. Well, at least on paper, we are discounting the tactics here. But, in fact, there is a big but that is the precursor of all this analysis. It is pretty much sure that Amram Rex will be recovered by the Russians in the same way Russian weapons have been recovered in Ukraine. Are the United States keen of letting even an Amram C in the hands of the Russians? Sure, it is not the latest version, there is an entirely new weapon coming, but still, Will the US be willing to run the risk? Amrams are already present in Ukraine with the NASAM system, but they are way less exposed to the risk of capture. This is a question that doesn't have an answer yet, but a refusal to give the Amram C to Ukraine could cripple the entire project. Because the Amram B is no match for the Russian weapons. It is not really worth discussing within visual range combat in depth because the situation is going to happen for sure, but it won't make the difference for acquiring air superiority. In visual range, Su-35s and Su-30 should have a slight edge over the F-16, while the MiG-31 will be dead <laughs> should it get into the visual range of an F-16 at normal speeds. And we are always discounting the tactics, so this is again an abstract judgment, just in theory. What is worth discussing, though, are the air-to-ground capabilities that will be provided by these aircraft. The first air-to-ground capability that matters is SEAD and DEAD, suppression of air defenses and destruction of air defenses. The Dutch and Norwegian F-16s are integrated with the AGM-88 Harm since software version 2.0. Now they should be all on version 7.2. There is a full integration so the weapon can be used in all the available modes. I did not find any information about the integration with the onboard electronics warfare suite, but it is reasonable to expect that this system may work together to an extent. As far as I know, the ANASQ-213 harm targeting pod in use in the United States Air Force was never sold to European Air Forces. However, the Dutch Air Force deploys a recently upgraded ANALQ-131 electronic warfare pods that could work in conjunction with the harm, but this is just a conjecture. These pods could be transferred too, since the F-35 doesn't need them, but they are very modern, so what has been discussed for the Amram applies for these pods too. The key point, though, is that these aircraft are not ideal platforms for the suppression and destruction of air defenses. They are an improvement to the makeshift harm integration with the MiG-29 and the Su-27, but they do not bring with them this additional capability. So, in theory, on a pure technical level, the F-16 would be an improvement of the current situation for Ukraine, but it would not guarantee the acquisition of air superiority. I know that this will upset some of the viewers, luckily just a vocal minority who can't believe that anything American isn't the best in the world, but this is what I'm thinking. I may be wrong, but this is what the data available tell me. Anyway, leaving this consideration aside for the moment, what could these aircraft do for air-to-ground against anything else? Well, on the F-16, you can integrate almost everything. The aircraft being given should be running the software version 7.2, which integrates JDAMs, laser-guided weapons, small diameter bombs, and anything else. This is probably the strong point of the F-16, the capability of being adaptable to a vast panoply of American weapons and also a few European ones. Then, so what would be needed in Ukraine? In the current situation, without the air superiority, it is long-range weapons. If I'm correct with the software, though, there is none available and the Americans won't give the crown jewels for sure, like the, the JASM, for example. 
However, let's suppose that some form of air superiority could be established, eventually temporarily, then the requirement would be relatively simple. Medium precision weapons like the JDAM for fixed point targets, laser guided weapons for precision strikes, associated eventually with a targeting pod, and finally a weapon of the class of the AGM 65 Maverick or the British Brimstone to attack moving targets. We discussed this aspect several times. Fighter armed with four guided weapons capable of hitting four different targets in a single mission is exerting the core tenet of air power. A single fighter hitting four tanks in a battalion in a single pass has inflicted in two minutes enough losses to push the battalion commander to reconsider these options, slowing down or blocking the mission. This is the essence of air power. So for air to ground, the problem is more what the Americans may want to provide rather than what is available in the Netherlands or in Norway. After all, at least part of these weapons can still be used with the upcoming F-35s, so those may not be released together with the airframes. So, now we have 40 aircraft and we know how to find some weapons. How can we build an air force around them? Well, building an air force during a war is a daunting task. Even more so when your infrastructures are within enemy's reach. The reason why I say so is because moving from the Soviet heritage model to a modern NATO model is almost as complex as rebuilding the organization from scratch. It's like when you change your job and move up the ladder. Your, your core competencies will still be useful in your new job, but you will have to quickly learn the way of a new organization, new relationships, new people and new competencies to fully function in the new position. Imagine this for the entire Air Force, for every job, for every technology, and you have an idea of the enormity of the project. But there's more. The Ukrainians would want this new air force up and running by the end of the summer to help with the counteroffensive, which is bonkers. Or, or better, maybe it's possible, but let me explain. Let's start from the infrastructure. The F-16 requires well-maintained air bases with long regular runways, hangars, specific tools and parts for maintenance. And a pretty substantial team of people to keep flying indefinitely. They will have to eat, sleep, poop, the usual stuff. And incidentally, the same could be said of Western high-technology weapons, which are comparatively more complex than Russian or Soviet equivalents. Actually, a source with practical experience on the aircraft explained to me how the aircraft is not as delicate as some of the articles in the press have described it. It could operate for some time in rather austere conditions and with a reduced team of maintainers, but this will likely increase the wear and tear, and anyway, sooner or later, it would require the pole level maintenance. Considering that the F-16s being provided to Ukraine will be quite old, it is well possible that they will require quite a lot of depot maintenance. And obviously, to do that, you need a depot. When a new modern aircraft is introduced in an air force, usually it takes two or three years to create the infrastructure, the organization, and crucially, crucially, have the web of contracts with civilian suppliers in place, guarantee that the infrastructure and the aircraft can be kept operating. Considering that all the Ukrainian air bases are within reach of Russian cruiser and ballistic missiles, this kind of infrastructure might end up having a short and painful life. The implications are quite severe and branch out everywhere. For example, a civilian contractor may find it impossible to ensure its activities with Ukrainian air force at an affordable rate. Obviously, it's always possible to defend the bases with ground-based air defenses and harden them to absorb the attacks. While the latter is sort of doable even by a country under attack, actually, Ukraine declared that they are already working on it, former is a big problem. Ukrainians' original air defenses are dwindling and Western systems are not available in large numbers. And those available are very expensive for the donors some form of defense will be necessary, and it is yet to be determined what it will be. 
The alternative is to operate the aircraft, actually almost all of them, from improvised road strips hidden somewhere in the western part of the country. This is what they were doing with the MiG-29 at the beginning of the war. They got to the point of having the aircraft taken off from one place, execute the mission, land somewhere else, partially disassemble the aircraft and move it somewhere else with trucks to reassemble it and execute another mission. I don't know for sure, but I doubt that this can be done with the F-16. Sure, some level of dispersal is possible, how much it has to be seen. And the other problem is obviously pilots. In peacetime, it takes 18 to 24 months to get a NATO pilot to the point it could proficiently use the aircraft and even longer to be fully combat ready in all the various articulations of the profession. A pilot could be combat ready in air-to-ground, but not in air-to-air, -air, or it could not be qualified for a specific weapon, or in some other aspects like in-flight refueling and so on. Sure, in wartime some corners could be cut, for example Ukraine doesn't really need in-flight refueling or naval operations, but we are still talking at least one year. In the press, an anonymous US instructor went on record saying that an expert pilot could learn how to fly and use the F-16 in about 90 days. This is not true. This is basically the time required to learn what every button and lever on the aircraft does. After that, pilots need to be qualified for each weapon that they're going to use. And after that, pilots need to train together as a two-ship formation or a four-ship formation. And after that, they need to learn how to operate in complex contexts with a few a two- or four-ship formations working together. Additional training is necessary to learn a fundamental task like SEED and DED, which is incidentally crucial for Ukraine. Sure, you can drop pilot in combat after 90 days, but you will be wasting a pilot and an aircraft that it took so long to acquire, and both are very difficult to replace. How many pilots are available for training, considering that there is a war going on? I've seen different numbers in sources, but they should be between 20 and 30. This could be fewer pilots than the available aircraft. So it is possible that they are thinking to a progressive introduction in service, replacing the old Soviet aircraft and transferring the pilots to the F-16s. And there is always the possibility that at least some volunteer foreign pilots will fly the aircraft and they will serve as weapons and tactic instructors. This is a delicate matter with very political implications. So far, the US is inclined to avoid this because it is perceived as escalatory, but it is a possibility. I personally believe it will happen, but it will be kept secret. So overall, having pilots fully ready to fly all the aircraft seems an uphill task. But there's a further issue that is hardly talked about, the ground crews. According to the United States Air Force standard, it takes one year training for a mechanic to be able to work autonomously on the aircraft with supervision. And it takes at least three years to become a supervisor and double that to become a crew chief. As usual, during wartime, corners may be cut, but we're talking years as for the pilots. I have seen no mention of training schemes for Ukrainian ground crews. I heard no discussions or working hypotheses. I'm sure they are not forgotten, but training them is almost as complex as training the pilots, and there should be many more of them. Since the aircraft are European variants, it is also possible that at least some of the training should happen in the country that donated the aircraft that may or may not have the availability. It would be even worse if the aircraft were upgraded or all brought to the same standard before the delivery to Ukraine. Because in this case, there would be nobody capable of training the crews on an aircraft variant that doesn't exist yet. After all, the pilot can familiarize with a new instrument, say a new radar warning receiver on the simulator. But there's no such thing for the ground crews. This doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that the aircraft will be delivered as is after a standard overhaul because anything more would dilate the time too much. Ukrainians are in a rush now, and at the end of the day, both pilots and ground crews need functioning aircraft to complete the training. A ground crew should be about 12 operators, but to operate 24-7, you need at least double that. And you need reserves because people get sick, injured, go to leave or get killed. 
for about 40 aircraft, it approaches a thousand people. I have seen none of them so far. So this is a big question mark. And last but not least, Ukrainian command and control structure may not be adequate to the F-16. Ukrainian planning process is still inspired to the centralized Soviet style, top-down approach that gives detailed orders to the mission commander on how to execute a specific mission. NATO planning communicates a specific objective and a general commander intent, while the planning has an important bottom-up component. Coordination among different units is normal and there are established procedures in place. Furthermore, in NATO doctrine, pilots and local commanders are given much more autonomy than in Ukraine. It would be ironic if it wasn't tragic. The Russians, after more than a year of war, seem to be progressively moving away from those inflexible doctrines. This was an issue that was already on VKS radar, pun intended, before the war, and change was already happening. Ukrainians, though, despite being very ingenious and resourceful, did not change the core of their operational doctrine. Some understated Western critics, in fact, have appeared in specialized sources. The F-16, as a multi-role aircraft, is indeed very suited to NATO operations. Its capabilities would be partially wasted if employed in a Soviet-style operations, these are only the main challenges that Ukrainian Air Force will have to overcome to put the F-16 in service, but there are many more. For example, what is the compatibility of Ukrainian existing jet fuel fluids and consumables reserves with the F-16s? Or, for the ground personnel, how complex will it be using an Imperial versus metric torque wrench? I can probably go on for a long time, but I don't think it would be very interesting. Much more interesting is another question. How do they even hope to have all of this available by the end of the summer? From what we have seen, the transition process takes years and it can be compressed too much without compromising the entire effort. So, is this plan unrealistic? Well, no, it is not. I have reason to think that Pilot's training has been already ongoing since at least the autumn of 2022. There are only rumors about this, so take them as such, but I have reason to believe that at least a small group of pilots have been working on the transition for a while. I know nothing about the ground crews, but there is a solution for that too, private contractors. We said before that these may have serious issues operating inside Ukraine, but there is at least a partial solution for that. All the depot-level maintenance might be executed in Poland or Romania, and maybe even more than just the depot level, so to minimize the amount of work to be executed in Ukraine by Ukrainian personnel that won't exist. It is even possible that these private contractors under adequate economic guarantees, they will agree to a limited presence in Ukraine. The aircraft will be based in Ukrainian territory, they will be fueled and armed in Ukrainian territory, they will operate from Ukrainian territory, but at least at the beginning, they will often fly back and forth from the neighboring countries for maintenance. If I am right, we will suddenly see a squadron appear in the autumn of 2023. If I'm not, it will take about one year. Sure, this solution is escalatory and the Russians may want to try sniping at the aircraft flying in and out of Ukraine with the risk of hitting something else. Or, even worse, in case of a substantial defeat on the ground caused by the use of air power, they may want to directly attack the facilities in NATO territory, which is something I don't want to think about. I suppose that this is the aspect that is concerning me the most in this entire business of setting up a NATO-compliant air force in Ukraine. And this brings us to the last chapter of our analysis. What are these aircraft going to do on the ground? So now Ukraine has, uh, well, well, I mean a hypothetical now, not exactly now. Now, Ukraine has, say, three squadrons of F-16s, armed to the teeth, well-trained, with volunteers and contractor support, and eager to show their capability. What can they do on the ground? What kind of effect can they have on the wall? 
Well, they're up against about 300 combat aircraft, about a third of the VKS fleet allocated to the operations in Ukraine. They are a mixed bag of aircraft, some are modern and efficient, some are just okay, some are so-so. Many are specialized platforms with no equivalent in the West. But there's something that is common to all of them. Their pilots are now all veterans with combat experience. The VKS has shown various problems in this war, but it is a mature and experienced force to be dismissed at your own peril. What would Ukrainians do in this case? Well, I have no connection with the commander of the Ukrainian Air Force, so this part would be highly speculative. Well, if they follow the NATO doctrine, they would try to acquire air superiority first. To acquire air superiority, as we have seen, they will have to neutralize the Russian integrated air defenses first. Let's assume that they have the equipment and the training to do so. We have 36 aircraft, three squadrons of 12. Considering the inevitable attrition, this could mean a surge of 30 missions a day for five to 10 days, and then a decline to about 10 to 15 missions a day for the F-16 fleet for a longer period. In theory, the surge could be more than that, but as we have seen, the maintenance conditions in Ukraine will never be ideal, at least at the beginning. About half the missions will need to be escorts because the VKS fighters will be active. These units are worn by the intense operation during the summer and the autumn of 2022, but in the first part of 2023 have been sitting there recovering and training, so we may expect that they will be reactive. This leaves, say, 15 aircraft attacking the Russian ground-based air defenses every day for 10 days. 150 destruction of air defenses missions, let's say each one destroying one target, which is a bit optimistic but not impossible. Well, the Russians have hundreds of systems with thousands of ground-based air defenses vehicles of all types. The destruction of 150 will be a very serious dent, but by no means a damage that can't be recovered. True, the radar vehicles will suffer more losses than launchers, but there are radars on many mobile medium and short-range defenses that will command attention as well. And consider that many of the long-range systems are outside the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, and in theory, they should not be attacked. Because this is one of the strings attached to the aircraft, never use them against the Russian territory. I suppose that this string will have some degree of elasticity, but in general we won't see many attacks beyond the Russian border. At the same time, the attacker will suffer losses from the same ground-based air defenses that they are attacking and from the Russian fighters. As we have seen, the couple F-16 plus Amram will often level the field with the Russians and the remaining 15 air-to-air -air aircraft might have some success in keeping the Russians away from the air-to-ground missions. There will still be cases where uh, they will have to run away because they will be attacked from a distance that leaves no hope of replying and the missions will need to be aborted. I imagine that the F-16 systems will give the pilots a better warning about incoming weapons so the survivability will be increased. Ukrainians will also have the advantage of deciding when and where to attack while the Russians will have to keep combat air patrols active to respond to the surge. Everything considered, a 10% loss rate during the surge period should be expected. At the end of the period, the F-16 units will have to rest and regroup and eventually start shipping some of the aircraft beyond the border for maintenance and the mission rate will drop. But there's a factor that we didn't consider yet. The air bases used by the F-16s will be a priority target for the Russians, exactly because these aircraft may be capable of making a serious dent in the ground-based air defenses. What remains of the Russian long-range ballistic weapons will be focused against them, and it is unrealistic to think that the Western air defenses will be capable of fully protecting them. Some damage will happen, some disruption will occur. It is even possible that the Russians will attempt a major attack, Soviet-style, which will be expensive but justified by the impact that these aircraft will be having. And actually, should this happen, the losses that the Russians might suffer in these attacks would be the most impactful effect of these aircraft in the medium term. So, if our speculation is right, the F-16s will have a very tangible impact, but they won't tilt the equilibrium of the war in favor of Ukraine. 
There is no Wunderwaffe in this world. It's always the combination of several factors, different nature, that determines victory or defeat. I may be right, I may be wrong. I am just an idiot who speaks with the vacuum cleaner. I definitely can confirm this point, sir. Thank you for getting this far in the video. I hope that you like this format. It's very demanding for me on several levels, but if you liked it, I can do more. Please leave a comment, like, and subscribe. This will help a lot. This is a time when I'm going through some difficulties. The algorithm wasn't kind to me and any form of support is welcome. And a way of supporting the channel is watching the past videos. There are more than 300, so I'm sure you will find something that you will like to watch next. An enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one of donations. Patrons and members have access to the sources that I use to research the videos, so I think it may be interesting for all those who are uh, really passionate about these things. Another way of helping the channel is buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I will have a small percentage to no additional cost to you. So, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Thank you.